I wanted it to be funny, tense, and erotic. Oh yeah. Okay. Three on three, ten on ten. Oh yeah. This is season two of the best parts, and we're speaking with actor and filmmaker Konkana Sen Sharma about the mirror from Lust Stories two. idea for the film came from like what was the elevator pitch so what happened is that uh, ashi dua who's my wonderful producer came to me saying we're making last stories the second installment and would you direct a segment for us so first of all i was like oh shit i don't have a story ready and i may not be able to do it so i told her give me a few months if i can come up with a story then we'll do it if i can't then you know you'll have to move on because what i can't bear is you know taking money from people and then not being and then having to write something for them and then you know it weighs so heavily on me and so then it was in my head last was in my head <laughs> i was looking for last hard to come back when one day a friend of mine invited me to dinner and at that dinner she told us a story a little anecdote about how she came home from work one day with a terrible migraine <laughs> went to her room and found that um the domestic worker in her house was in bed with a man having sex and she apparently ran out to the living room and uh you know the domestic worker came out and you know just handed over the key and left that was the original story but you know when i heard it and it was also the way people were reacting people were like oh my god and it delighted me I thought, oh my God, everything is here in this situation. I immediately told her, I'm using this. Then I started thinking about that story, and um, also a little bit, I guess, imagining what would happen right. after, right. and I guess inserting myself in the situation. Right. And I think that some conversations are so difficult to have, perhaps because there's no precedent for it. or we don't have the vocabulary depending you know what is the language we're speaking in is it a language we're used to speaking these we're things not, we're not experienced in even processing things like this yeah. right because so much so much of our cliche and our it comes in the way before yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly so i thought that and i don't know i just started imagining me in my childhood home and i just you know it just could it was just like that just it it was just visualizing and i could see that you know i run out i'm hiding in the uh, you know i'm calling back my friend ninna <laughs> and i'm and, and you know and then they walk out and i'm hiding because i don't know how to confront it and that's why in the middle of the film where there is a confrontation scene they actually slip into the default social conditioning right it is not and we'll yeah. come to it later yeah, we'll to it. yeah yeah but it's it's that's how it originated so then when i developed and i developed it with a wonderful writer uh pooja tulani who co-wrote the film with me and we had such a it was so delightful because we were like oh my god should we oh my god can we speak about this thing so we said this we were like let's see what happens and that's how we just put in uh you know and then we stretched it we just stretched that further and further and that's how you know it originated yeah because i don't think even uh, anyone expected it to be so funny yeah. and like so cheap. i wanted it to be funny tense and erotic oh yeah okay 3 on 3 10 on that number <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> this is telling when you were making this movie all right uh were there any particular checks and balances that you needed while on set or you know was it like you hear the word intimacy coordinator a lot these days and you know did you have to maneuver around in any way that you wouldn't have had to do normally for a film that you were making um see i really need death in the gun really before this and that also had a couple of intimate scenes but i think that and i've not had an intimacy coordinator for either Uh, intimacy coordinators have started now, not guns time. But I've not had an intimacy coordinator. The thing is that a lot of this planning and prepping is actually when uh, one is writing and planning. Okay, what am I going to put on screen? Yeah. What I mean, how much is okay? So everything the film already exists in your head. At least in this case for me, the film all I had to I could visualize the film from beginning to end in my head. Okay, you know, so a lot of this is the planning of this is in advance. Like, how am I going to see this? Like, for example, when Ishita is watching Sima, and I want Sima to find out that Ishita is watching, but Ishita not to know that she is being watched. 
So I was thinking, how would she find out? So obviously the first thought that came was, is the phone ringing? Is, did a phone ring? And I thought it can't be because obviously, you know, she's been regularly coming and watching. She's putting her phone on silent. She's taking off her shoes, right? She's entering so quietly. So something has to fall. And then I don't know how the lizard is, you know, because these are my own, uh, yeah. the things I'm scared of, yeah. you know, lizards, frogs, and death in the gun. Frogs, yes. yeah. Yeah. Once I knew what the script was, in the time of prep, we actually did a sex breakdown. Like what, there were six different positions of sex in the film. So sex position one, sex position two, who are involved, what exactly can be seen, what is the camera angle, what are they wearing, what is art department doing, what is costume department doing. So we would have a meeting, you know, of this breakdown and everybody had to know exactly what they were doing. Actually, when you're on set, it's just like, it's, I feel like that's just execution. It's just go, 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 go of everything that you plan. Now you're just writing the exam. So now things like last year, it gets a really bad rap, right? In religion, in cultural settings and stuff like that. If you watch the film Seven, uh, you know that Christianity deems it one of the seven deadly sins. And, and in Hinduism, lust is one of the five main obstacles to enlightenment. Okay, The others are ignorance, egoism, attachment, aversion, and clinging to life. So it's like another day on social media, to be honest, you know. <laughs> So when you were making the film in the anthology, okay, firstly, were there any rules that you felt needed to be broken or anything you wanted to do differently? Because see, the domestic track record for depicting desire, I think, you know, it leaves something to be mm. uh, imagined. Yeah. Firstly, to the religious, ancient religious texts, so cannot be a manifesto at all, uh, any of them, because I don't feel none of them are relevant, really, definitely not to me. And if somebody else wants to, then uh, absolutely they must. But for me, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense at all. And also the other thing is that I feel absolutely no pressure to participate in existing frameworks. You know, like maybe it has always been like this or, you know, this is the way it's been depicted. It may be, but I then choose to disregard you know, because then that is the way, otherwise, you know, then, then you are trapped into thinking like that. You know, is there anything uh, in our depiction of desire in film, whether, whatever, that's something that, you know, that there are lots of cliches and tropes. Mm. Is there anything that you have felt like, what is this? Or that you felt has been done well, just as an example. So I watch very few films actually. I watch very few films, I'll own because you know, there is no time in life to watch or read mediocre shit. Yeah. So I'll only watch or read something that's come highly recommended from my trusted sources and I have my own. Even for Death in the Guns, there was a picnic at Hanging Rock which was there as a kind of a loose inspiration. Maybe in terms of tone or what exactly, I don't even know. Um, for this, it was um, Michael Haneke's The Piano Teacher. Because I really enjoyed the depiction of, uh, you know, the protagonist and her sexuality. But it's so dangerous and so unsafe uh, and pushes so many boundaries and limits. Uh, which is, I mean, even for me, you know, when I was watching it, I was like, oh, I was only being at home, you know. <laughs> And I'm really, I'm not a prude. No, I know. I'm the prude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm not a prude. And I'm not easy to shock, you know. There is a scene where she, anyway, I won't see it. It's, it's irrelevant. Right? But she, she's actually, she makes some kind of a confused, complicated advance towards her mother. Oh, well. They have a very, <laughs> they have a very complex relationship, actually. So sometimes the act of lust, is actually masking shame? Is it masking a need for connection? How is it intertwined with class? Like there's so many other intersections which are coming, which, you know, a little bit here we've tried to explore. Right. Because when you're looking at last, you're looking at, I mean, what's interesting is you're looking at an individual. Right. That individual the cross section of male, female, rich, poor, basics, I'm saying, it's, your, it's, it's a fingerprint, print, right? It's unique, your, yes. your, your, your relation to your own last. Yeah, and, and for me, the most important thing was at the end of the film, Seema says, uh, <laughs> So I feel for me, that's the main thing to be able to own your desire is so rare. And women, particularly, are allowed, are 
not allowed na by and by and by it is discouraged by and this yeah. yeah it's not seen as ideal yeah it's not on our to do list <laughs> so you know either let's like i want to talk about the women characters for a minute you know, there's a deep vulnerability to ishita and you know she has this inscrutable exterior and doesn't seem like she's having a lot of fun at work and then she's listening to her friend talk about something while she has a migraine you know there's a little sense of that her being quite a giving person what i want to do is is there some facade of self sufficiency with her character is she pretending to be much more self sufficient than she is you know i think with ishita i, I, I and of course this is just my feeling and what viewers feel are equally valid but for me I, uh, i've drawn it in very broad strokes in some ways and you know the viewer is really filling in details depending on their perspective so a lot of people have said loneliness actually i did not start out thinking loneliness because i know so many single intelligent women you know living very fulfilling lives i mean of course everybody's lives are, has ups and downs but there is so many single women whom i admire deeply who are living on their own you know and sometimes in little envious actually <laughs> but uh, so it's i had not thought it as loneliness for me who's not a single person living alone you know it was almost like wow <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. i i it's, it was almost something you aspire to say me that maybe something that seema has i mean seema needs a little space you know a room of her own as well outside of her husband and her in-laws and her children so this what ishita is and the filling in of ishita i think is an interesting thing that you know different viewers are putting in differently so it could be that you know it could be that she is lonely it could be that she is self sufficient i don't think she's dissatisfied at her job personally speaking okay. because i feel like it's her design form right and she must have good days and bad days right and she seems to be doing fairly well right you know and uh, yes this i th- i think this friendship is Uh, that she has with Sammy on the phone, you know, and I conduct a lot of my. I think girlfriends chat with each other on the phone uh, is my experience, but perhaps this particular girlfriend is somebody she's kind of a little bit outgrown. Yeah, that's the thing. And yeah, that's yeah. what's my thought when I was writing about uh, that character on the phone. That it's a friendship she's outgrown a little. Yeah, that's pretty. That's beautiful because I think yeah, that I mean we all get there eventually. Yeah. <laughs> in the cliche way is having it all what used to be having it all and what actually have it, having it all is it, it depends on you yeah. you could be sitting yes. at home alone in the the arctic and have it all right yes. i'm talking from the outside perspective my my no, my the only thing is that there is a kind of tenderness that seema has to ishita and i'm wondering whether she whether it was you know when you were developing the character whether like what was seema's attitude to ishita It's so nice that you saw some tenderness in that. So it was not an intentional thing. I think definitely that they, these two women have a good equation. They have a good working relationship. This I wanted to establish. Yeah. And the fact that they've been probably working together for some time, like it's an in job indeterminate kind of a time. You know, whatever. Yeah. I would imagine five, six yeah. years. There's a comfort. Yeah. Level. Yes. Definitely. To the extent that I think Sima also feels. I don't think Sima really thinks she's doing anything wrong. In my mind, Sima is transgressing because she is using, you know, her space without yeah. her consent. Yeah. And Ishita is also transgressing. Uh, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to worry about the right and wrong and the morality of it because for me, they are two thieves who are stealing pleasure from each other. You know. So in that sense, I think, and I think they have a good working relationship. I think they trust each other. I don't think that Sima is too bothered about Ishita. Actually, oh, okay, you know, okay, okay. because you know she's like, hi, this is because this is what I I know what I need. To, she's good at her job, right? You know, and and she trusts this person, and they have a decent equation. You know, somebody had suggested, how come they don't have a cup of tea sometimes? Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I have not seen that very much, personally speaking, and I don't want to make it sweet. Mm-hmm. I don't want it to be sweet that they are actually companions and having tea every evening. I don't want that to be a ritual, and it's not a ritual I've seen very often. Right? You don't see. Maybe some people do it, but it would, yeah, there would, there would, it would be a coloring of a situation that maybe mm. was not. Mm. Because when the situation explodes, mm. yeah, <laughs> and Ishita becomes a subject of gossip. Actually, Seema seems to get off quite okay. She gets a job, and she's on with it. And and you know, we were talking about this, and in the real world, 
like what would happen yeah that's true so in the real world firstly none of this could ever happen in the real world <laughs> this is just completely i have taken my i've, I've done what i wish the world to be and you know so many times we say you have to be what you want to see you know be the change or whatever so yeah, that's because in the real world i feel it's just it, seema the employer is at such a huge disadvantage in so many ways compared to ishita the employer that there is no question of any equality actually right so because the lack of income for seema is much more devastating right right um i didn't want but i was just determined firstly i like the symmetry of these two women you yeah. know that after in my mind they they both probably around 40 and they are whatever one is a watcher one is a watchy one is an employer one is an employee uh, you know as so they they are in that sense reflections and the mirror for me is is the only portal through which they can actually connect and have some kind of fake yeah it's like a multi- temporary equality, equality yeah, yeah. which is not at all there in the real world so purposely because i wanted at least in my world in this world of the film i wanted ishita to suffer because she has too much she has too much yeah. and she should suffer <laughs> but you know i mean when she must wait for the first time after watching seema as she cries mad she's like yeah, already suffered it's a very common thing there are many people men and women and i researched this uh maybe more women who cry after an orgasm whether masturbating or otherwise look at it it's there so and i just found it such an interesting and intimate moment which is unexplored yeah and again you can fill in what you want why is she crying is she crying because maybe she couldn't reach orgasm is she crying because she doesn't get any sex is the quality of her sex not as good is she just having casual sex and she wants a committed relationship we don't know she has a terrible headache as well yeah. you know so we don't know exactly why she's crying again you know these there 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 are some spaces where, where you can hold what the viewers putting in as well yeah. but it's one of my favorite things i just love that un- unexplained uh um, moment this whole thing what you were just saying of focusing on yourself and being free of social roles this is the multiverse you've created for that moment or that you know to be sexy and like you know a uh, part of this gendered burden of how desire should be excited in another uh, it comes in the roles you're finishing to play like good girl but don't be the vamp when you're young and if you're a dutiful mother you have to forget how you might have gotten pregnant in the first place like i stood in the sun and i got pregnant you know it was totally like kosha and in the mirror ishita and seema are dumping their social roles and focusing entirely on themselves so it's quite you pretty much hit the nail on the head over there just instinctively i'm happy to hear this because you know uh, the, and sex is also so different no what i mean is that every time you have sex it's not the same sometimes it's a little bit of revenge sometimes it can be some loneliness yeah. sometimes you're playing a part in your head yeah. you know there's so many different kinds of sex you know that it can be and sometimes and apparently many women don't always orgasm yeah women don't always orgasm from penetration um many women don't masturbate or at least till they're quite old but of all this is there what is distracting them i think is this um uh, taking away uh, the focus from themselves their bodies being in the moment because they're remembering the thing what do i have to do next tomorrow i have to go to the ptm are the washing machine you know has broken it's like it's like an exercise in mindfulness <laughs> yeah <laughs> mindful sex yeah what what i want to know is when seema realizes that ishita has been watching her okay yeah there are all those moments where she's looking at herself on in the phone and everything and she sees herself differently and it's different from being desired by a boring old husband right uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah I think so because what I saw now the thing is the problem here is that unfortunately there have been many films which have looked at the bodies of domestic labor female domestic labor in an exploitative way and fucked it for everyone else right now i was not coming from that place at all um for me it was also the fact that i think for seema 
See what is Seema seeing in terms of the expression of desire of a de like the representation of a desirable woman around her. She's seeing in ads. She's seeing on hoardings. She's seeing amongst people who are supposed to be desirable. None of them look like her. So her body is never seen as an object of desire in the world, because in the world we are seeing, you know, mainly. people as we've said before many times we men and women who are young and thin and fair and yeah what was the last one rich probably right. or at least not terribly poor uh, so uh, where was i the sorry see yeah so, so maybe for her it's like oh you know that that this is also desirable yeah. that i my body is desirable to the outside world interesting moment the and, and i felt that she enjoys being watched there are people who are me have an exhibition streak you know and she perhaps she enjoys being watched because actually you know see some interesting things we did in terms of camera work like the camera never went inside the bedroom where seema is having sex until seema knew so in a way for me it was that seema has given me permission to come inside the bedroom so the first time the seema knows that ishita is watching is the first time the camera goes into the bedroom and we see seema's That's orgasm brilliant. we never see her orgasm deliberately before that so basically this is your uh, countdown to seema's consent Yeah, I mean, in a way, I was. We can't go in yet because you know. I mean, then we can't go in yet. Then we are with Ishita. We are transgressing right. with Ishita. Right. You know, <laughs> this beautiful thing with uh, Tilutama, like she literally spits. Like there is, it's so intense. And Seema reminds me when she and Ishita calls it disgusting, and Seema reminds her she was with Paul, so she cooked and she cleaned and she washed her underwear, and then she turns the knife. And this is where my early question came from. She reminds her that she's so dependent. She was like, you know, now you need me even to orgasm. काम भी खुद के हाथ से करने को नहीं होता है, खुद से एक मर्द भी नहीं ला सकती। इसको ठंडा करने के लिए मेरे को मैं चाहिए। सीमा। Get out! And it's very intense, it's very bitter, and I want to know how. Yeah, I want to tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, me and Pooja. But you know, in English, that line was, you need me to cook, to clean, and to come. That no, like Pooja has, uh, yeah, Pooja has brilliantly translated. इसको ठंडा रखने के लिए भी इसी हिस्से में बहुत lovely. So I wanted to see those lines because I knew that the women who will be watching this are the Ishitas of the world and not the Seemas. Oh, and big point, yeah, yeah. And and which is why I enter the film with Ishita and not with Seema because I felt a little bad because I felt like why am I not entering the film with Seema? Why am I not starting with Seema? And it's because I'm luring in the Ishitas that it's fine. You know, safe, nice. and it's okay to be like, oh my god, my my body is having sex on my bed. You know, I want you know, and so then the audience is also like, oh my god, and we can all perform this. Oh no, <laughs> you know. But then, then to turn it around on its head, now you think Ishita doesn't know that Sima doesn't have space to have sex in her house. She should. We all know. She's not thought about. We it. all should know this because all our in our cities, we know how people live. Or at least we should know. And I wanted to tell the Ishitas of the world, which include me, that that, that this line was very important for me. That you have given me the keys because you cannot be asked to get up in the morning and open the door. Yeah, and तेरी चड्डी तब तो मैं धोती. I really and I show it. She she actually hangs up her. Underwear in one shot because I wanted to show it. So space is so important, you know, in the sense who has the space for what, who is allowed space, which kind of bodies are allowed space, right? And which kind of bodies can afford privacy, right. you know? So these were the issues, and I wanted to, I wanted to see that. And what happens quickly, I'll say, is that you know when, uh, when they have that confrontation scene and they're fighting, they actually slip into their conditioning yes. because. Because it is the easiest thing to slip into your social conditioning, which may not necessarily be the most just thing. It may not be the correct thing to do. It may not be the moral thing to do. But it is the acceptable social thing to do. But the means, Gandhi, yeah. it's so easy to perform that outrage where Kamal, the husband, is a stand-in for society, so they can feel it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes we can be surprised by our own ick factor, right? Like, where is the only fans people by the elderly? 
Like I've been asking that for ages. But, but that that porn is uh, diverse. Most people porn is there. Everything is there. Yeah. Everything is there. Uh, so there's not much representation, and then of course there are preconceptions, right? That only a new partner can turn you on. Do poor people have time for romance? Couples in long-term relationships don't have sex. Okay. Now, were there any personal preconceptions that you had to unlearn or? You know, was there anything? I mean, I know you Google, so <laughs> no. So one thing which we realized after the first draft of the script is, where is Kamal's consent? Yeah. In the first draft of the script, we were so excited about Shrijita and Seema. We forgot to number the husband whose body is being used. Yeah. Terrible yeah. oversight. But it was just the first draft. <laughs> and the thing is, consent is a concept. It needn't be a gendered concept. And it should, yeah. But but the thing is, it applies. No, but she turned it around beautifully because actually nobody thought about poor Kamal. Nobody, <laughs> nobody thought. Like, like, of all the conversations he was going to have with her outside in the gully, yeah. yeah, you know, I was like, oh, because for me, he's the conscience of the film. Tila mai chut. Tula mai chut. And mana. Yeah. He's the conscious yes. of the film because he asks her when she keeps saying what you've done. She keeps saying, "Arey, don't worry. She knew. She knew." And he's the one who says, "You don't think you did anything wrong?" And she doesn't answer. And she, she says she knew. And so then Kamal is like, "Yeah, she knew. You knew. What about me?" And I just feel that's such an important thing. And at least it's brought up. I don't feel it's uh, resolved. Yeah. You know, because I think that fights also when you have it's not resolved like the first time you uh, reach out. You know, like it's it's a process. So maybe the thawing has started in that sense. But how lovely it is that he is turned on by her desire. That's and yes, that is so beautiful because you know that intimate understanding of his wife. All right, I mean you're blowing away many preconceptions. You know what I'm saying and. It's culture and class agnostic the way you presented that empathy is possible for everyone and it's obviously the key to a great sex life. You know, yeah, no, I think so. I think and uh, did, did guys react to that part of the film? Like, did like any guy go, "Hey man, what about me, man?" <laughs> so That's luckily, how guys go. no. Um, so some people said, "What if it was? What if Ishita was not a woman?" Oh yeah, <laughs> That's like, like what if she was a guy who was watching? Then I said, if it, then it would have been a guy watching another guy, firstly, right, and not a guy watching a woman. I was not interested, at least, in depicting that. But then that's another film, and that one will have to then work out all the things of those of that particular uh, combination. Yeah, yeah, I know. But also now you've just startled me because, <laughs> you know, with women we assume it's okay, and that he's watch, she's watching cinema. You don't think for a minute. But is it okay that she's watching Seema? I mean, I don't. We have a very long conversation. We just we don't have that kind of time, Coco. But you know, <laughs> like we just assume she's watching Seema mostly, not Kamal. But then she's, she's watching them. Man. Yeah. What having sex? She's watching yeah. them. But Kal se. Okay. So the film ends with a return to normalcy. Okay. So now everyone is on board. Everyone's watching everybody else. Okay, and the situation has made me very nervous. Uh, all right. So, did you think of alternate endings, or you were okay? Like, chalo, this. this I purposely wanted to show this. I wanted to show that now Seema knows, Kamal knows, Ishita knows. It is three o'clock. The lift is coming up. The door is opening, and it is none of your business. What these three consenting adults are doing is none of your business. Stay out of it. If you've reached the end of the episode, hey, we love you back. Subscribe to the Swaddle for more such videos.